Welcome to this Ophir Photonics webinar. My name is Mark Slutsky. I'm the product manager for power and energy measurement solutions here at uh, Ophir Photonics. And thanks for joining us today. I hope everyone's uh, healthy and uh, hanging in there. Right, I'm assuming you're somewhat familiar more or less with Ophir. Some years back, we were acquired by Newport. Some years later, Newport along with us became part of MKS Instruments. Basically what it says in that slide, if I can boil it down to its essence, is that we like to do the hard stuff that you would appreciate getting off your head so you can focus on your work where you bring added value and not have to lose sleep over the tools that you're going to need to get it done. I, I think that's a fair summary. Okay, so here's the agenda we're going to cover. First, just to get us all on the same page, a quick overview of typical applications that are out there nowadays uh, of high power lasers, just so we have some appreciation of the kind of problems that we're going to be looking at, how we'd like to try to solve. Uh, again, a very quick overview of why we measure and how we measure. We're not going into any great engineering depths about, you know, not to, trying to turn anyone into a laser measurement, you know, power meter design engineer, interesting as that is, uh, but more just to have an appreciation of what we're going to be talking about later. Um, then we'll get into the meat and potatoes, the challenges that we have to deal with when we're measuring these kind of high power, typically industrial type lasers and typical and some not quite typical and quite innovative solutions um, for performing those measurements. Again, not going into engineering depth of how exactly they work and how to design them, but what they do and how they can be used and what they can give you. Uh, and then we'll have a look at some uh, some sort of a black belt best practices and tips for getting the best performance out of whatever um, solutions you're using. So let's uh, jump in, starting at the beginning, quick overview of today's high power laser applications. Obviously research, but th that's almost what I might call trivial. Uh, quite typically we're looking at applications that involve in one form or another material processing and more likely heavy duty material processing, automotive, aircraft manufacturing, you know, the, the big, you know, brute force kind of stuff um, where we're using the power of a laser beam to burn, zap, or otherwise vaporize material. So automotive, of course, here you can see a jet engine turbine blade. You can hopefully, I hope the resolution is good enough. I hope you can see a pattern of cooling holes here that would have been pretty much impossible to produce using traditional mechanical type of uh, manufacturing techniques. Where's my forward button here? Okay, um, not necessarily a big business segment, but it's still cool enough that I wanted to mention it. Uh, military, the joke always was, and kind of still as that, you know, that this is always, you know, a few years into the future, um, the, the gurus talk about something like 100 kilowatts is what you would need to really make this kind of technology useful and uh, dealing with the sort of threats that are out there, like that ballistic missile type of things. But uh, for smaller targets, you don't need that kind of power. Here you see some technology demonstrators, a Boeing system shooting down a drone, a couple kilowatts. This is, this is from... 2009, it's not, uh, not something from this morning, um, a vehicle mounted uh, test bed for a 10 kilowatt uh, uh, system and so on. So there's a lot here. Here you see some snippets of articles that I found in the literature just about a year or two ago. So it definitely is out there. The technology, I, I don't know if the technology would be driven by that because again, from a business point of view, at this point in time, I don't really know how much business is out there yet, but it is moving forward. The industrial commercial motivation is what's really pushing this forward. And obviously the uh, other application areas will benefit from that as well. Uh, just for the sake of completeness, I just wanna mention because we often find customers discussing with us and we need to clarify that there's a difference between high peak power or instantaneous power and high power, which usually refers to high average power. So even though we're not really gonna focus on this today, but I just wanna mention it, there are applications where what the parameter, where the parameter of interest is the peak power, the instantaneous power during the course of a short pulse. Um, the high peak power as opposed to high average power basically means a relatively high energy pulse 
with a very short pulse width or pulse duration. So the instantaneous power, remember power is energy per time. So if you've got a even not that high energy pulse, but coming over the course of a very short period of time, even you know, some significant fraction of a joule, but you know, with a pulse width of nanoseconds or picoseconds or femtoseconds, so the instantaneous power or peak power can be extremely high. Um, here we're talking about applications where we don't want thermal effects to damage surrounding material, micro machining that makes, you know, there are a lot of applications that make use of this kind of thing. And it's an interesting application I came across some time ago, certain types of marking of syringes where they use ultra short pulses that change the refractive index of the glass to give the appearance of printed symbols. This, as you can appreciate, uh, places very interesting demands on the absorber that's gonna be used in any sensor that you're gonna to wanna to measure this kind of laser with. But again, I'm mentioning this more for the sake of completeness and to preempt any possible confusion, but we're not really gonna get into that today. Um, some of the trends that are driving the constantly and rapidly increasing power levels that we see, one of the main enablers of this advance is the, you know, the development of fiber lasers. Uh, we're at the risk of oversimplifying. Basically, to get more power, you just use a longer fiber. Now, obviously, it's not quite as simple as that, but in essence, that's kind of what it really depends on. There are plenty of issues that are pressing on the brakes in this sort of thing, uh, dealing with uh, thermal constraints. Uh, where does all that heat go? Uh, it's not a trivial thing. Uh, a lot of um, external issues that are you know, that come from the various applications that to some extent slow down this scaling up of power, but it's slowing down, it's certainly not stopping. One of the interesting things to keep in mind is that these ever higher power laser sources are of interest not only to applications that specifically need that higher power. Uh, you can have a multi tens of kilowatt laser where you divide the beam among multiple parallel processing, station, processing stations, each of which might be using only a few kilowatts, but because all of that power originates in one laser, you have much better control over a whole range of laser parameters. You've got better uniformity, better control across these multiple workstations, and we see that quite often. Um, okay, why and how? I trust that I'm not gonna need to really belabor this point uh, with this kind of a forum, but just so that our eye is on the ball, let's remind ourselves why, when and why it's important. So here's a schematic drawing, pardon my artistic skills or lack of, um, of a typical generic materials, material processing application. So in order to melt, vaporize, or otherwise zap the given material, we want a laser beam with a given power and, of course, wavelength and, 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 okay, to be focused down to a given diameter so that the power density, watts per square centimeter, basically, is high enough to do the work. So here we see the space within which we have the required power density, and somewhere smack in the middle of it is where we're going to put our target uh, workpiece. Uh, we design and program the system so that the user punches in a given application and the system sets up the exact electrical parameters, the appropriate drive current and whatever it may be, such that a beam with the exact optical parameters will be generated. But what happens if the power drifts due perhaps to aging of some components or say heating effects, changing the optical characteristics of the focusing lens and therefore the focus ends up shifting and we can suddenly find ourselves with the target um, workpiece outside the space within which the power density is high enough to do the work. So we may end up with the process not working or working but not well. Um, and if we're talking about uh, you know, the process becoming uncontrolled and unpredictable, in the case of an industrial commercial process that can eat into the profits that it's supposed to be generating. Again, as I said, I trust I don't need to belabor this point, but you get the idea. Now, obviously there are gonna be applications where it won't be quite so critical. If I'm manufacturing laser pointers for use in office presentations, Honestly speaking, it may not be quite so critical whether, you know, if the output is 0.5 milliwatts or 0.55 milliwatts. But uh, we're 
today talking about applications where it is critical. Okay, how we do the measuring. And again, I'm, we're not going into great engineering uh, depth, just touching on the concepts that are relevant to the sort of lasers that we're dealing with today. Um, this is a basic type of thermal sensor used for measuring average power as well as single shot pulse energy of moderate and high uh, power beams. Uh, there are somewhat specialized configurations for specific needs. We'll touch on some of them uh, as they come up. But basically, a laser beam, picture it coming towards you. Not a pleasant thing to be picturing if we're talking about a, you know, multiple tens of kilowatt beam, but okay. Um, towards you, to, you know, from behind the plane of your screen. This disc, we're looking at the inner surface of the disc, so you can actually see the thermopile ring in this case. Uh, the beam would be absorbed from the other side of this disc. There's an appropriate absorber there. It, the absorbed light turns into heat, which then sprays radially outward. We measure the heat flow. It's proportional to the power of the beam that came in. The constant of proportion, by the way, is what we measure when we calibrate the sensor. Then the heat, so it generates an electrical signal that's uh, proportional to the beam. It's the, cal the, fact the sensor is calibrated, so the instrument will then know how to convert that signal into a reading. The heat then had better go away, otherwise the temperature is going to build up and something unpleasant is gonna, might end up happening to the sensor. All right, there are additional parameters that we're, again, not going to get into today, but I have to mention them. The beam profile is very often extremely critical because it affects the beam profile. I mean, the spatial, sp not special, spatial distribution uh, of the power through the beam cross-section. Um, that affects the focusability, if there's such a word, of the beam and the shape of the focal spot and therefore of the cut or the hole or the weld and so on. As you well know, we have solutions for, measure, for you know, measuring the beam profile of high power beams way beyond the scope of today's discussion. But I have to mention it. Additional uh, parameters, pulse energy. If we're dealing with a pulse beam, a lot of welding, welding applications make use of the energy per pulse as opposed to the average power. Um, there are you know, solutions for what we might call quick and dirty measurements of the beam power position and size without necessarily getting information about the actual spatial distribution within the cross section, just the size. Beam dumps, if you're dealing with a high power beam and you're sampling a fraction of it, you might want to give some thought to what's happening to the rest. Um, typical solution would be to use a beam dump to safely absorb it. You could prefer to use your colleague across the lab if he's in any competition with you, but uh, we won't go there. Okay, so typical laser power meter consists of some kind of a sensor which receives the beam and generates an electrical signal that represents the parameter of interest. In today's discussion, that would be the power. And then you have an output. So here the output is a handheld meter. The output might not be a handheld meter. The output could be software running on a PC, for example. Um, I'm only mentioning this because in a little while we're gonna be looking at some all-in-one solutions. But conceptually, this is a laser power meter. Very often the sensor is used to provide real-time feedback control to the laser. In some applications, this sort of a self-calibration, maybe we'll call it, of the laser system is performed periodically, say once a day, once an X, fill in the blank, or maybe before each new workpiece, as relevant to every given application. The sensor can be integrated inside a system on an OEM basis, sampling a small part of the beam near the laser, behind the rear mirror of the laser if you're using that kind of a laser. Alternatively, it can be used externally, moved into and out of the beam, again, as needed. Um, many of our customers, we uh, use what we call it, what they call a calibration port, where there's a small sensor constantly monitoring half a percent, one percent of the beam coming out of the laser. Um, that makes it possible to use a small and inexpensive sensor uh, and it monitors constantly because it's the monitoring is actually not interrupting the beam. But on the other hand, it only catches um, change, unwanted changes that originate at the laser. It won't catch changes that happen farther downstream, such as the aging of components or focal shift or things like that. 
So what these customers often do is they put a full-blown, full-power sensor inside their system, and periodically, once a day, once an X, the user fires the full power of the laser into this calibration port where it gets measured, and the system compares what it's measuring to what it was expecting to measure based on its preset internal settings, and then if needed, it makes automatically uh, makes uh, internal, uh, internal adjustments. This is kind of the best of both worlds. Um, again, just an idea. Uh, as an interesting side point, but uh, worth being aware of, um, everyone knows or should know to measure the power outside the focus. You don't want to measure in focus. Uh, in focus is where the power density is high enough to drill, cut, weld, vaporize, and otherwise zap your workpiece. And if you put your sensor there, then you may very likely drill, cut, weld, vaporize, or otherwise zap your sensor. Not a good thing to do. It's the same number of watts out of focus as in focus, but certainly not the same number of watts per square centimeter. Um, less known is that it's all other things being equal, it's often preferable to measure before focus rather than after focus, as, the focal, as in the focal spot, uh, there are often losses caused by photoacoustic shockwave effects. Uh, more, the shorter the pulses, the more pronounced this effect can become. Just a very cool thing that I uh, thought I would share with you. Okay, this is a question we get asked all the time, sometimes explicitly, sometimes hiding beneath the surface. Um, I'm an engineer, or we have engineers. Um, why can't I? Why do I need to buy a full-blown, calibrated, highly accurate laser power meter? Why don't I just buy a, you know, a photo diode from an online catalog for a dollar or less, and you know, my engineers or I can, you know, rig together and amplify. You know, wh why do I need a full-blown? Why do I need to outsource this? Okay, that's basically how we might word the question. So the answer is you could do this yourself. It's, you know, it sounds easy enough when you say it fast, right? Accept a cheap photodiode. Um, you'll need a lot of attenuation, many orders of magnitude that may introduce anomalies into the measurement. You'll need to take into account and compensate for the temperature dependence of semiconductor photodiodes, the frequency dependence if it's a pulse laser of semiconductor photodiodes. You'll need to take into account the batch to batch variations in the performance of these cheap photodiodes. Uh, they do exactly what they're supposed to do, um, but not what they're not designed to do. Uh, and many applications do need an absolute, a quantifiably, uh, a quantifiable absolute accuracy to some degree or another. Now, these are addressable issues, but addressing these issues will involve costs, very possibly costs that won't show up on your BOM, on your bill of materials, but your engineer's time also costs money. And we, we find this all the time. I, I, I hope I'm not misunderstood here, in particular with startups uh, who then come back to us a year later and say, okay, okay, th this is draining um, we want to outsource this. This is not where we want to be spending our time. Yes, we could do it, but that's not what we want to be doing. Now that we realize that it's not quite as simple as we thought, we'd rather not have to do, you know, spend the, the resources. And it, it's just a very common thing. So I, I had to mention that. Um, here's an interesting case study. This is actually an article on our website. Um, some years back, a customer of ours, manufa large manufacturer of medical devices. What you're looking at here is an implantable medical device. I have no clue what exactly it is, but it doesn't matter. Um, and this customer was producing this particular component at two different um, facilities of theirs simultaneously. Same laser, same laser process, same setup, same everything, except that the parts coming out of one facility were good and the parts coming out of another facility kept on failing, luckily at inspection. Uh, the welds were not good. The laser welds, obviously, that's why we're here. That's why we're talking about it. They couldn't figure out what the problem was because the two processes at these two facilities were designed to be identical. 
So they asked us to help them out and it turns out that they were designed to be identical, but in one of the facilities, something in the optical path of the, of the beam had gone out of alignment and the beam profile was not exactly as it was supposed to be. Uh, once they found the problem, then fixing it was relatively easy. Uh, but this is just an example, uh, a good example. Okay, now meat and potatoes time, measurement challenges uh, and solutions. Um, we'll begin with the challenges. Um, a high power laser beam carries a lot of, well, power. And when a sensor absorbs and measures that beam, the optical power of the beam turns into, into heat, uh, which we need to remove from the sensor at least as fast as it's coming in. Otherwise, the sensor, as we said, is going to heat up and eventually something is going to fail. Usually the first point of failure is going to be the thermopile junction, which would end up resulting in instant sensor death, as, as we might call it. Um, so for lower power sensors, conduction of heat from the sensor body out to the surrounding air is enough. But as the powers increase, we need to help that along by adding a fan. And the sort of power levels that we're talking about today, we're generally talking about water cooling. Um, another challenge is damage. So there are lots of ways of damaging a sensor. One is the, what we just looked at a moment ago, too much power, no measuring device likes to be overloaded. But much more common um, is too much power density. Even if it's a moderate power level, but focused down to a small enough spot, we can drill, cut, weld, zap, vaporize our sensor. And that actually happens very often. Okay, I don't know, very often, but often. Um, it is, okay, this picture just, I had to put this in because, you know, I have heard stories about um, mischievous young nerdy kids who are going to grow up to be physicists one day, taking a magnifying glass out into the garden on a sunny day and you know, carrying out unprovoked attacks, causing bodily harm on innocent passing insects. So I've heard from other people, of course. Um, it's important to note that the maximum power density that a given absorber material can handle, its damage threshold, by the way, maximum energy density of a pulse beam is also a damage threshold. Just keep that in mind. Uh, the power density damage threshold is not a fixed number. It actually depends on the power. And I wanna show you why that's so. So here's our absorber and the y-axis is the temperature. So let's say we have a low power beam at the spot at which the beam is being absorbed. That spot gets heated up. The surrounding material is also kind of hot as that heat is moving out of the way. And here we see a screenshot from actually the thermal simulation software that our engineers use to design these things. Now let's increase the power, same absorber, but now we're talking about a high power beam. The spot at which the beam is being absorbed is not kind of hot, it's really hot. And there's so much heat that the surrounding material, a lot of the surrounding material is still very hot, not just sort of slightly hot. And the heat that's continuously being generated at this absorption spot has a harder time getting out of the way here than here because there's a big crowd around it that it needs to push its way through. And here's a screenshot from the thermal, sim thermal simulation software for this case. So as you can appreciate then, um, it'll take way fewer watts per square centimeter in this case to bring that spot up to the temperature at which the material will burn than was the case here. In other words, the damage threshold at low power is much higher than the damage threshold at, at high power where it's already much lower. So it, Ophir's um, sensor data sheets, by the way, um, reflect this and we always state the damage threshold at the highest power for which a given sensor is designed because if you're considering buying that sensor, it's probably because you're gonna be working at somewhere near the highest power. Um, def definitely something extremely important to keep in mind. Another challenge is backscatter. Typical thermal absor you know, sensor absorbers uh, absorb something like 90%, a little more, a little less, depending on the wavelength. The other 10% is not being absorbed, meaning it's being reflected. 
typically these absorber materials are matte, so the reflection is diffused, but still, if we're talking about many tens of kilowatts, then that's many kilowatts that are being, you know, backscattered back out into the room and something that uh, definitely could present a safety hazard to personnel that are in the area. Right. Another challenge is industrial environments. Uh, first of all, the footprint. Think of, okay, a really high-tech industrial environment. Think of any typical modern you know, semiconductor wafer fab. Um, real estate in that room is extremely valuable. And before they bring another measurement instrument, they want to make sure that the floor space and what, you know, other resources that it's going to be taking up um, is worth it for them. Um, not every industrial application is as super demanding as a fab, but still, we want to you know, make sure that the instrument justifies the resources such as floor space that it's going to be taking up. Also, uh, the instrument in many cases, not only fabs, um, the modern production floor is becoming ever more automated and there, we see less and less people walking around there that can press buttons to take the measurements. So in many of these applications, we want the instrument to be operated remotely, preferably automatically, and that it can be integrated into the factory floor network. Uh, another issue is the constantly increasing power levels that we're seeing. How, you know, in a couple of years from now, the power of the lasers I'm using in my process will probably be a lot higher than they are now. Am I going to need to completely replace the measurement technology that I'm using to monitor my process? Or will I just need to maybe add another sensor or something like that? These are all things that are, you know, that we face. Okay, let's talk about solutions. Good thing to do. So again, we talked, we mentioned cooling, preventing and avoiding damage, um, backscatter, industrial environments, both in terms of footprint and in terms of uh, in being in easy to integrate into a into a production floor network, and ever increasing powers. So let's start with cooling. Okay, this one we kind of gave away already uh, when we first presented it. Um, here you see a fan cooled sensor for up to 1.1 kilowatts. It's as I said, I would do this is an Ophir sensor. To the best of my knowledge, this is the only fan cooled sensor for kilowatt power range. Uh, usually, though, for the sort of high power industrial applications that we're talking about, water cooling is the method of choice. Um, the lasers themselves are also generally water cooled. So here you see a bunch of water cooled sensors. Um, now we'll see some of those specialized configurations that I mentioned earlier. Um, there are some cooler ones coming up, uh, pun somewhat intended. Um, so here we see, you know, uh, this is a 15 kilowatt sensor with its protective cover on with a target put, you know, printed on it to help with alignment of the laser. Uh, 16 kilowatt sensor, 30 kilowatt. You'll notice that as the power increases, the sensor becomes more massive. At this point already, the mounting hardware already is a little bit different in order to be able to hold that mass. Um, you can also see, though, that there are some other configurations. These are all thermopile based. The radial thermopile configuration that we saw before. But here we see something a little different. Here we see some sensors that are calorimetric based, meaning um, we're measuring the temperature rise of the coolant as an indicator of the power of the beam or the temperature rise of the, what we at Ophir call the puck. We expose it to a very tightly controlled um, um, exposure time and the instrument knows the uh, specific heat capacity of the material and so on and so on. And then we, you know, we get a reading that, you know, so the temperature rise of this puck after exposure of precisely so and so many seconds um, is an indicator of the power. Here, we're measuring two things. We're actually measuring the temperature rise of the cooling water, and we're measuring the flow rate of the cooling water. And those two pieces of information together uh, enable us to enable the instrument. Don't, you know, the user doesn't have to worry about the calculation, uh, but that enables the instrument to then 
figure out the power of the beam. I just want to say something about this 16 kilowatt sensor. It's uh, we released this a couple of years back. I just want to point out this module over here. Um, and then we're a little in about a minute or two, we're going to say something about cooling water. I just want to point out this module. This is an alarm and interlock module. The user can hook this up uh, and configure it so that if there's any uh, failure in the cooling water system, it can automatically disable the laser to prevent overheating from damaging uh, the sensor in case of such failure of the cooling water system. Um, Next challenge, preventing damage. Uh, first and most obvious solution step is to make sure that you're operating below the specified damage threshold of your sensor. That means keeping below the maximum rated power density. And if, you have a, if you're working with a pulse laser, keeping below the specified energy density. And I wanna, I wanna emphasize that because a lot of times people don't think about the energy density because I'm only measuring the power, but okay, I'm only measuring the power uh, so I understand that I want to keep below the maximum power density, but even if I'm not measuring energy, too much energy density can still damage my sensor. So it's something you want to be aware of. Um, so if we look at an example of an output screen from the Ophir sensor finder, uh, we see that for each sensor that comes up as a potential solution, one of the pieces of information the sensor finder gives you is how far you are under these laser conditions that you entered, this power, this beam size, whatever, whatever, how far below the damage threshold are you? So in this case, for example, all other things being equal, this sensor at the laser conditions that I entered would be operating at 56% of the damage threshold. This sensor at 48%, not a huge difference, but all other things being equal, I'll probably prefer to choose this sensor. Oh, I had some animations here that I forgot I put in there. Okay. Um, more generally, there's always an ongoing effort to develop absorbers with better and better damage threshold for CW beams, for pulse beams, with long pulses, with short pulses. Uh, usually what works for one doesn't necessarily work for the other. It's not by accident that one of the first words we ever learn in an engineering curriculum is the word trade-off. So here you see a water-cooled five kilowatt sensor based on what we call the LP2 absorber. LP stands for long pulse. Um, 10 kilowatts, whoops, 10 kilowatts per square centimeter maximum average power density at the full power of a kilowatt, which is quite impressive, and also 400 joules per square centimeter at 10 millisecond pulse widths, which is a typical pulse width in many of the industrial applications. Just like the maximum power density is not a number, but it changes with the power. The maximum energy density is not a fixed number. It changes with the pulse width. Shorter pulses are much more challenging than longer pulses or CW. Um, a trick that I wish we could claim credit for, but everybody in the industry uses it, is that reflective cone that I hope you can see in there. Uh, again, remembering that the higher the power, the lower the damage threshold. So you would think that for a 10 kilowatt uh, sensor, the damage threshold will really be unimpressive. So we use other tricks to maximize that. What happens here is that instead of this being the absorber, the cylindrical wall perpendicular to the plane of the sensor is the absorber, and the beam comes in, it meets this reflective cone, gets reflected radially outward with a divergence angle, so that by the time the beam reaches the absorber, it has diverged We've expanded the beam, so we've lowered the power density so the sensor can work at much higher power, power densities than it otherwise would have. Its damage threshold at the full 10 kilowatt power is actually the same 10 kilowatts per square centimeter as was the case over here um, with the regular absorbers. So all sorts of tricks that we use. Okay, backscatter. It's evening, my throat is getting shot from talking too much, but okay. Um, remember that somewhere around 10% of the power being reflected back out into the room 
So we have an optional accessory that you can attach to the front flange of your sensor. I don't know if you can quite see what it looks like in there, but there's inward facing ribs over here. So a large fraction of the backscattered um, beam um, on its way out meets the inner walls of this scatter shield, as we called it, and are then reflected back in because of the structure of the ribs on that wall. Ribs, ridges, I think ridges is a better word. Um, so this actually reduces the backscatter coming out of the sensor into the room by up to, or up to something like 70%. So all that, so something like 70% of that 10% is being sent back into the sensor a second time. Now, 90% of that will be absorbed and 10% of that will be backscattered. But okay, we've cut that, cut down the backscatter very significantly. Of course, the meter will need to know that the scatter shield has been added. There needs to be a separate calibration factor for the scatter shield in condition because more light from that same beam is going to end up being absorbed by the sensor. Industrial environments. So we'll, we'll begin with the footprint issue. Uh, there are various ways to measure high laser powers without needing a very massive water-cooled sensor. Uh, the basic idea is that we want to limit the exposure time to the high power to as short a time as possible. So the trick that we uh, use in some of our sensors and some of our instruments is what we call pulsed power mode. The basic idea is that you fire the laser for a short, precisely controlled time. We treat that short exposure to a high power beam as a pulse, quote unquote, and we measure the energy of that pulse. Um, now, remembering that power is energy over time, we divide the measured energy by the known exposure time or pulse width in, in double quotation marks. Uh, and that gives us the power that was coming in during that pulse. That's the peak power, the instantaneous power. Now, we can do that manually. Uh, that's kind of trivial, but we can make it a lot easier by having the instrument do it either semi-automatically by asking the user to manually enter the pulse width and then it'll do the calculation. We, uh, we can also do the calculation, but it makes life easier when the instrument just asks you to enter the, pulse, the, the exposure time and then it'll do the rest. Um, or fully automatically if the instrument needs to be fully automatic and we can equip the, you know, the, the device with a fast photodiode to measure the exposure time and then it, you, the user doesn't even need to do that. So I just want to show you what I mean by semi-automatically. I'm just going to share my screen for a second. Uh, how do I share my screen? Um, 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 um. Here, share. Share content. Share screen. Okay. Here we are. Um, this is just what it looks like on... Uh, this is an Ophir instrument with... a. Uh, sensor. Okay. And this is what it looks like. It Notice it prompts the user to enter the pulse width. We're in pulsed power mode. And when the laser fires, we get the power. You'll notice this is only like three milliwatts. I did this in my office for the purpose of demonstrating it. So I couldn't quite do the 10 kilowatt thing, but you get the idea. Um, so for this purpose uh, at Ophir, we've given a lot of our moderate power sensors a very high energy scale so that we can measure these multi-kilowatt beams using this trick. Um, okay, regarding the challenges of making a monitoring solution suitable for industrial environments, besides footprint, we also mentioned factory integration. Uh, so now let's just briefly look at some self-contained instruments. These make use of the pulse power concept, but they do it automatically they measure the exposure time using a built-in photodiode. So here's an, a device, we call it the Helios Plus. It's actually a family of devices. It's 20 centimeters long, it's small. So obviously it's not massive and it's not water-cooled. Um, and you know, you'll notice the industrial body, there's a protective cover that is remotely opened when it's time to take a measurement so that the rest of the time, the sensor's window is protected from process debris. You'll notice the industrial connectors. So this can get connected daisy chain into a factory floor network. We have different models based on different protocols, Profinet, Ethernet over IP, EtherCAT, and so on. This particular device can measure up to 12 kilowatts uh, from a short exposure. 
Um, now, another self-contained instrument, uh, we released this a couple years, you know, I think two years ago, I guess three, to address a very common industrial process scenario. Um, think of high, you know, industrial high power measurement in a tight, inaccessible space, no option for water cooling. Okay, basically think of a manuf of additive manufacturing chamber. There's powder in there, so you can't even use sand cooling. And there's no way that a person can walk up to the instrument and press a button or enter an exposure time. All right, so here's what the device looks like. This actually is called the Ariel. Um, it took quite a while after its release until I found out that Ariel is actually an astronomical term, as are many Ophir product names. It's one of the moons of, if I remember correctly, the planet Neptune. It also happens to be the name of one of my grandsons, but uh, that was not the reason we chose the name. Okay, it's self-contained, built-in display, rechargeable battery. It, there are buttons here, so it can be operated by a human finger, but the main way of using this is through Bluetooth from your Android device. So you stick it into the chamber and you can control your measurements uh, remotely. Uh, very, very cool device. This one measures up to eight kilowatts. Won't go into the details, various modes, uh, various spectral ranges and so on. Exposure to high power, you know, exposure time as short as uh, 50 milliseconds, depending on all the details. Okay, moving right along. Um, okay, I think I actually explained this, the concept of pulse power a few slides ago, so we just saved ourselves another minute or two. Okay, scalability. Um, we mentioned scalability of the measuring technology to ever higher powers, keeping pace with the scaling up of laser technology. What you're looking at here, you may remember that you saw it in one of the earlier slides, but there it was just one of a bunch of sensors. This is the first commercial sensor for measuring up to 120 kilowatts. It is designed for fiber lasers, high power. It's a desktop device, uh, you, you can't really see the scale here, but it's 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters, 200 millimeter aperture. And because it works something like a black body, the inner surface of it is lined by black coated um, cooling water tubes. Uh, so less than 1% of the incoming power actually makes it back out as backscatter, which is a comforting thought when we're dealing with 120 kilowatts. Um, here you can see it at a customer installation measuring, in this case, it was measuring about 100 kilowatts. And in front of it is something called Beam Watch. I have to say something about this. Um, it's a non contact high power beam analyzer that Ophir Spiracon came, came up with some years back. It's based on Rayleigh scattering, where some of the light from the high intensity beam is scattered off air molecules in the vicinity of the beam waste. And a camera uses that light to capture and then analyze an image of the beam waste. Um, <clears throat> awesome concept. Okay, some best practices and tips. Um, probably the first one that we really have to start with is keep your sensor clean. Okay, what you're looking at here is a thermal sensor with a standard you know, broadband absorber. Um, apparently some uh, uh, some, some kind of organic debris must have splashed onto the sensor and got burned on by the next exposure to a high power beam. Had they not waited until the next exposure to a high power beam, it would have probably been very easy to clean that off. Tissue with a, a suitable cleaning agent on our website, we have some recommendations of how to clean the different sensor types. Most of them, ethanol, a soft optical type tissue with ethanol or methanol, in most cases, is all you need to do. In some cases, you can't. The sensors that have that reflective cone, the, the cone, you don't want to touch it with anything. So there it's a, you know, um, blowing clean air. But most of the absorber types, tissue with ethanol, methanol, in some cases, acetone, uh, something that's uh, apparently well known. I mean, I, I'm not one. I don't have the knowledge that the lab technicians have, but Umicore substrate cleaner number two. They tell me that the whole everybody in this industry knows that stuff. So whatever, it would have been so easy to clean it off. But once it got burned on, then that sensor would need a relatively expensive disc replacement. Um, prevention is always 
better than cure, better than repair. We have uh, some uh, optional uh, you know, accessories that we have. Uh, this is a protective housing with a remotely actuated shutter so that when your process is going on, it's covered. When your process is not going on and you want to take a measurement, a TTL pulse opens the shutter. You take your measurement. When the TTL pulse stops, the shutter springs back into the closed position. We've got a few different models of that sort of thing. Highly recommended to prevent rather than repair. Um, okay, some more best practices, uh, beam positioning and alignment. In general, as far as possible, try, you, we recommend that you keep your beam centered because when we calibrate the sensor, we keep the beam centered. And when you do your measurements, if you do the same, then you've just eliminated the variable of uniformity of tolerance across the aperture, you've eliminated that as a variable that could affect accuracy. Um, I'll also mention that we usually keep the beam to somewhere between one third and two thirds um, of the full aperture. Won't go into that now, but uh, uh, it max it, you're eliminating the small localized non-uniformities from having an effect where you're also keeping away from the damage threshold, but at the other end, you're also keeping the beam not too big so that you don't unwittingly chop off some of the outer bits of it uh, by the aperture. Um, with a, when, when you're using one of those sensors that has a reflective cone, it's more critical to keep the beam properly centered because there, if the beam's not properly centered, some of the beam might miss the cone and therefore won't get expanded by that divergence angle that the cone creates. And we every now and then get a sensor coming in for repair with burn spots that were clearly caused by a not properly centered beam. You also wanna keep the beam aligned, uh, keep the incidence angle as close to normal incidence as possible. Um, both of these parameters are usually specified in the data sheets. Okay, here's an interesting one. We've got a white paper about this on our website. We've got a video about this on our website. Um, zeroing and offset. Um, most power meters have an offset function, which removes zeros, optical and thermal offsets from, from you know, a DC component an unwanted DC component from your sensor. Um, so I'll just give you an example. Um, when I was actually relatively new at Ophir, customer was having some difficulties. It turns out that they brought their sensor in from a hot car out in the sunny parking lot. And if you're familiar with the Israeli summer, a, par a car in an outdoor parking lot can get extremely hot. And this, uh, you know, th this, person brought the sensor in from the hot car into his air conditioned lab, started taking measurements and was getting a really nasty offset. He didn't know where it was coming from. Turns out that the sensor was hot. It was actually a lot hotter than the air temperature in his comfortable air conditioned lab. So what happens when a hot sensor is in a cool room? It starts getting rid of its heat as it tries to reach thermal equilibrium. In other words, there's heat moving from the inside of the sensor to outside the sensor body and going off into the surrounding cool air. Now, isn't that exactly what happens to heat that's being generated when a laser beam gets absorbed by the sensor? Uh, that heat flow is actually what's being measured. But in addition to the heat flow that's being measured and from heat that was generated by a laser beam where we want to generate that heat, because that's what represents the laser power. There was, in addition to that, unwanted heat flow because the sensor was hot. So that was a DC component that was mes messing up his measurement. Now, knowing that a person may be tempted to press offset before turning on the laser and zeroing out that unwanted DC level. What's the problem with that? As the sensor continues to cool, and approaches thermal equilibrium with the air in the lab, the actual thermal offset will get smaller and smaller. But if I press the offset button, my instrument is gonna keep on subtracting that original offset 
from the reading, but that original offset is no longer really the offset. Basically, what we always recommend is wait until your sensor is in thermal equilibrium with its environment before you start working with it. And that way, when you then have an offset, it's an offset caused by some heat source near the area or a light source near the area of the measurement. And that's an honest bad offset that's constant. And then that's an offset that you'll be correctly subtracting when you press the offset button. Let's give a few best practice tips involving water cooling. Um, first of all, you want to turn the water flow on before turning on the laser. You might not appreciate how little time it could take to heat your sensor up to a point of damage by a high power laser in that you know, short time you turn on your laser and then you turn on the water flow by then the damage might have already been done. Okay, a question that very often comes up is what kind of water to use. Now, this is a bit complicated because uh, there have been customers who, saw, who suffered corrosion in their sensors water channels. And there were, have been, I've seen other customers who used similar sensors in the same industrial park using the same city tap water who didn't have corrosion. There's a lot of um, very subtle parameters that could make the difference. And there's a lot of very, very knowledgeable experts out there who earn, who earn their living because they have very, very solid knowledge of all of these parameters. Uh, but what we can tell you meanwhile is that all of the things being equal, DI water, deionized water, which gets a bad rap sometimes, is in fact a recommended type of water to use in a closed cooling water system, subject to the condition that you keep the pH level neutral. And that's probably where the bad reputation comes in. So if you're, you know, you can check that and there are ways of keeping the pH neutral, there are additives, there are methods of doing this, then we do recommend DI water. In many cases, city tap water works fine. Sometimes it doesn't, all right? And if that's of any concern, I warmly, I uh, refer you to a white paper that we have on our website. I'm going to show you how to find it in a moment. But just let's finish the bullets that I have on this slide, and we've got about one or two minutes left. Uh, cooling water temperature, we have specifications for the temperature range of the cooling water more in the, in the data sheets. More critical than the actual temperature is the stability of the temperature. Even slight fluctuations in the temperature or the flow rate could be picked up by the sensor and mess up the reading. Um, we often are asked, you know, can we recommend a chiller? We don't really recommend a ch specific chiller. The only thing that we care about, it, we're quite, you know, quite forgiving in terms of the details of the chiller. The main thing is that the chiller should have the capacity to remove the number of watts from the cooling water that you're going to be putting into it from your laser. So if you're gonna be measuring a 10 kilowatt laser, make sure your chiller can remove heat at least at a rate of 10 kilowatts uh, from, from the water. Uh, alarm and interlock, I showed you that before. Uh, I just wanna show you where to find that article. Uh, if you go to our website, Ophir, okay, Ophir Photonics, you uh, go to on the top main menu, support. Uh, you go find the knowledge center. And then you can do a search. The article is called How to Use Ophir Water-Cooled Sensors. Pretty uh, um, sensible title for that article. And that's, that's going to be the first item to come up. You'll remember that name, How to Use Ophir Water-Cooled Sensors. Okay, so in summary, we're one minute short of the hour. Um, we talked about you know, a brief overview of today's high-power laser applications. We did a quick overview of when and why it's important to get accurate measurements of your laser parameters. Sometimes it might not be, but usually it is. Very, very um, high altitude review of how. And then we talked about some of the measurement challenges, cooling, damage, backscatter, footprint, integration into factory networks, and scaling up of the laser's power. And then we talked about some best practices and tips Keeping the sensor clean is probably the best one. Um, you know, be careful before you press the offset button. 
wait till you're in thermal equilibrium. We said a few words about water cooling. More importantly, I pointed you in the direction of a very, very information packed white paper on our website that deals with water cooling issues, water flow conditions, temperature, pressure, et cetera, et cetera, and water type. Okay, wait, I think there are some questions that I might have missed. Yes, one question. Um, Ah, whoa, good one. Thank you. Just wondering whether, you know, uh, can we recalculate the power threshold for shorter pulses, femtosecond, than that given? Okay, that, oh, thank you for asking that. That's an important one. Uh, I mentioned just briefly that the shorter the pulse, the more susceptible an absor a given absorber is to damage. So the damage threshold for short pulses is not as nice a number as for high pulses, for, for longer pulses. The reason is that the shorter the pulse, the less the generated heat, uh, the less time it has to move out of the way during the course of that pulse. Now, from a th purely thermal point of view, once a pulse is shorter than, let's say, 100 nanoseconds, then the heat has no time to move out of the way. So you might think that it doesn't matter if the pulse is going to be even shorter. Turns out that, that that's not true. It is. It does matter. Um, we recently came out with an absorber type that's specifically optimized for shorter pulses. Uh, that is not yet reflected in our sensor finder. So I'm, if, uh, I'll just say that if you are involved in an application where you're dealing with pulses that are shorter than a couple of nanoseconds, speak to us before you choose the sensor um, to make sure that you're, you know, getting a sensor that will survive the experience. I'm very pleased you mentioned that. I totally hadn't thought of that. Okay, so, I realize this is a ton of information that was, you know, packed in, and I spoke quickly, but I uh, hope that this was helpful, dare I say, maybe even interesting. Um, if you would like to contact me offline, this is my email address. My name again is Mark Slutsky, Product Manager for Power and Energy Measurement Solutions at Ophir Photonics. I'm going to leave this up for a minute or so in case you need to take it up, uh, write it down. You're more than welcome to get a hold of me. You can contact us through our website, through our either Ophir office or our partners in your various countries. Um, okay, thank you very much for being with us. Stay healthy. Have a really nice rest of the day.